Hello booktube, Sarah here and welcome to my channel. Today I'm coming to you with my weekly reads for April the 20th through the 26th of 2019. Sorry for the noise in the background if you can hear it, the hubby's printing, but this is the only time I'm going to have to do to sit down and do this video over the next few days. I'm actually filming this on Thursday night. Uh, you guys are not going to see it till Saturday. But um, I have a friend coming up for the weekend, and she's arriving tomorrow, Friday, after work, and is staying till Sunday, sometime on Sunday. So I wanted to get this done um, and uploaded before she arrived, if at all possible, because I could have done it on Sunday, um, and it wouldn't have been that big a deal. But after having somebody here all weekend, I kind of wanted my downtime. Plus, Garrett and I are going to have to do grocery shopping on that day. Plus, I'm going to want to relax a bit before I go back to work on Monday. So I just thought, why not sit down? This will probably be a relatively short video, all things considered, for how long these usually are. But I'd like to get this filmed and uploaded, or edited at least tonight. And then I can always set it to upload, you know, Friday or something like that, or even Saturday while my friend and I are out. But um, I'll get into the weekend plans at the end of this video. So my weekly reads, for those of you who might be new, um, are I talk about all the books that I finished this week and there are six of them this week so not too shabby and I let you guys know what I'm currently reading and hoping to finish in the next week and I'm gonna share with you a book haul I only have two books that I bought um, this week so that's not too shabby um, I'm pretty pleased with myself actually that I was able to rein myself in but there will be some potential book buying this weekend so next week's might be a little bit longer um, and I'm going to show you some of my crafting. Again, not, nothing too, you know, out of the ordinary. And talk about some real life stuff. So let's jump in and get started. Um, so for the books that I finished this week, like I said, I finished six of them. The first one that I finished this week was The Unsung Hero by Suzanne Brockman. Um, this is a romantic suspense novel. It is book number one in the Troubleshooter series. This was narrated on audio by Patrick Laylor and Melanie Eubank. Um, published originally in 2000. Uh, 4.05 star rating on Goodreads and I gave it four stars. I read this book for Romanceopoly, which is hosted by the girls at the Under the Cover book blog and Jessica from Peace Love Books. Um, so this was a fun story. This was about um, Kelly and Tom were our two main characters. And the Troubleshooters is actually a SEAL team, a Navy SEAL team. And at the beginning of the story, Tom was gravely injured and he actually spent weeks in a coma. And he's been sent home to his childhood home. Um, well. He's been put on leave, medical leave, um, to kind of get his head back on straight, essentially. After spending all the time in the coma, they don't know whether there's any permanent brain damage or anything like that. So while he's back home in this very small town in uh, Massachusetts, in coastal Massachusetts, he begins seeing this man who he thinks is a, um, you know, like, international operative um, who is responsible for murdering all these people. His, he goes by the name The Merchant. So he's kind of trying to figure out, is he seeing him or is this all in his mind? And then along with that, he's developing a relationship with Kelly. And he knew Kelly when they were younger. This is not a second chance romance per se, because the two, even though she had a crush on him, and he may have had a little crush on her too, there was a bit of an age gap. I think she was like 15 to his 18. So nothing came of it. Nothing ever happened between the two of them. But, um, you know, because... At those ages, 15 to 18 can seem like a very big age gap, right? And now that they're older, though, of course, that age gap is much, much smaller. And um, so, yeah, it was really good. A lot of action in this book. Um, very interesting. I am very much looking forward to reading more books in this series. This is a long-running series by this author. And it was really enjoyable. If you enjoy a good, you know, romantic suspense that involves, you know, like a Navy SEAL kind of an idea... And also something that takes place in, like, small town, you know, New England. Fantastic. I really, really liked it and absolutely recommend it. Um, the next book that I finished was Her Texas X by Kathleen Gabrera. This is a contemporary romance novel. It is book number, or, yeah, it's book number one in the Dangerous Delaney series. This one is being, was published on April 18th. So I read this one through NetGalley. Um, it just came out last week. So if you're interested, check it out. Um, average rating of 4.31 stars on Goodreads. I gave this one four stars as well. Um, this is the story of Amelia and Cal. And this is a relatively short novel. It comes in at right around 150, 151 pages, I think, for the Kindle. So I'm counting it actually as a novella because I count the cutoff for a novella at about 150 pages. So... You know, it's it's right there. 
Um, but yeah, so this one's a shorter one, but very enjoyable, like I said. This is a second chance romance. It, it's, uh, excuse me, it's, like I said, it's about a woman by the name of Amelia who comes back to her small town um, in Texas, of course, and she um, runs into, or she comes back to care for her mother who is sick. She's broken her hip and she has two sisters and something happened before she left town when she was 18. And I don't want to give away what it is because it's kind of a, a plot point. I do think they give it to you on the back of the book, which is kind of silly, but regardless. Um, so she comes back um, after learning this family secret and she runs into her ex-boyfriend, Cal. And of course, the two of them develop a relationship again. Very cute, very sweet, short little novel or novella, I should say. Highly enjoyable. If you like a good contemporary romance, um, Kathleen Cabrera does a really good job with um, with these books and I absolutely recommend not only this book but the rest of her work as well. Um, the next one that I finished, I do have the physical book here to show you guys, is Vegas Vows and this is by Linda Randall Wis Wisdom. This is a, where is it here? Contemporary Romance of course. Harlequin American Romance number 541. This was published originally in 1994. This was part of my 40 Years of Harlequin project. Um, average rating on Goodreads of three stars, and I also gave it three stars. So this one wasn't anything spectacular. Don't rush out and purchase it, but if you come across it at a thrift store, or if you are interested, go ahead and pick it up. But it's not a must-read, let's put it that way. This was really cute. Takes place in Las Vegas. Our main character, Robin, is a morning show host for a, um, a morning show in Vegas. And she is very much against marriage. She has an ex-husband who's bleeding her dry financially. Uh, she's the one who makes the money, and he did not. So after their divorce, she actually pays him alimony. And it has really soured her um, on marriage. And Matt, our, main, our male lead, uh, runs a huge wedding business that caters to people who want weddings that are just slightly outside of the normal. And they put on these huge productions for weddings and the show that she works on or she hosts is doing an entire wedding week and she's kind of now being immersed within the wedding business and of course the two of them end up falling in love with each other. It was really adorable. Um, again, not anything ab absolutely spectacular, but a thoroughly enjoyable read, highly entertaining and I really did like it. So yeah. Um, the next one that I finished was The Babysitter's Winter Vacation. This was by Anna M. Merton. Let me toss that on the floor. Um, this is a, of course, middle grade fiction novel. Babysitter's Club Super Special number three, published originally in 1989. Um, this one has an average rating of 3.80 stars on Goodreads. I gave it three and a half stars. I mentioned this last week um, in when I was talking about the fact I was reading this book. Not my favorite of all the super specials but still my favorite cover in the entire run of the series. Um, so in this story, all the babysitters, it's a class trip, they go up to uh, a lodge in Vermont and they spend a week there doing winter type activities. They go skiing and skating and all these things. So the super specials are a little bit different than the regular series books where each chapter is narrated by a different babysitter or sometimes a different character within the stories. And you know, each one of them kind of has some sort of like a little adventure. And the main kind of outside of the fact that they're all at this lodge for a week, the B plot of it is that there is a group of young kids. Um, it's a bunch of different schools that go to this lodge at the same time every winter. And these younger kids end up getting in a bus wreck um, at the beginning and all the kids are fine. Their teachers are kind of injured. So the babysitters step forward and say, hey, we'll look after the kids for a week. And so the kids play, of course, a very big part in the story. I mean, it is the babysitters club. Every single story is going to involve children or babysitting at some point or for some reason. So, you know, that's how they played it into this one. And, you know, Claudia and Christy are kind of fighting against each other because there's this winter war going on and they're trying to beat each other. Um, and Stacy falls in love with some guy, you know, some French guy who lives also in Vermont, um, this boy. Um, and, you know, uh, the rest of the babysitters are kind of dealing with the kids. And Marianne's dealing with the fact that her boyfriend Logan is in Aruba. You know, I mean, there's kind of a lot going on, but these are really fun stories, and I read this one from my library, and I did enjoy it. I, I mean, I'm loving rereading this series. Um, the next one that I finished is another physical book, and that was Only Mine by Susan Mallory. Um, Contemporary Romance, Fool's Gold, book number four, um, published originally in 2011. Average rating of 4.11 stars on Goodreads. I gave it four stars. I wanted to give this one five stars, you guys. 
but it has one of the things that I despise in romance novels at the end. I don't want to give away the plot point because it's supposed to be like a twist, but I saw it coming a million miles away. Um, and it does bother me with the whole, oh my God, uh, I'm going to give it away. So spoiler alert if you guys have not read this one, but I know a lot of people, if you are a contemporary romance reader, you've probably read this one, that, oh my God, my doctor told me it was a one, one in a million shot that I'm never going to get pregnant. So I'm, of course, I'm going to sleep with, you know, the guy and, oh my God, the first time we slept together, guess what kids? I got pregnant. Like, nothing irks me more. It is, it's a big sticking point for me because the average woman who might get that same kind of diagnosis, it's never going to happen to her. And it's unrealistic and it's, I think it does a very big disservice to women who are in that situation or couples that are in that situation. Um, you know, it's nice to hear every now and then that, you know, miracles do happen to people, but on the average, it doesn't happen and it just it does upset me. It really does. Um, I don't use the term trigger because everything could be a trigger to, to anybody else. I mean, I, I wasn't upset over it. Um, it's not like, you know, sexual abuse or anything at all like that. But to a lot of women, this could be a big deal. So, you know, be, be that as it may, essentially. So in this story, the whole plot of the story, this is about Dakota and Finn. And I love the two of them together. I loved love them together. I thought they were adorable. So she's lived in fool school her whole life. And there is a, what do you call it? A reality TV show that is being filmed in town. And Finn's younger brothers, uh, twin brothers have gone to fool school to be on this show. And he's rather upset at them because he wanted them to finish college. They were in their last year of college. They dropped out, went from Alaska to fool school to be on this show. And of course he's trying to get them off the show. And he spends quite a bit of the book angry at them. Um, but of course he falls for Dakota and the two of them end up having a relationship, obviously. Um, it was a really cute story. I mean, I gave it four stars. I really enjoyed it. This is one of my, my more favorite ones in the series. Sorry, not the greatest of English right there. It's, I, I enjoyed this one more than some of the others I have read. But again, there's that plot point at the end that for me personally is a big sticking point And it did lose a half a star rating for that. I, I you know, it just... It really, really irks me. I'm sorry. And I just didn't care for it so much. Um, and the last book that I finished this week that I actually just finished today was Sworn to Silence by Linda uh, Cast Castillo, I believe is how you say her last name. This is a thriller. This is book number one in the Kate Burkholder series, narrated on audio by Kathleen Mc, uh, Mc McInery, published originally in 2009. Average rating of four stars on Goodreads. Guys, I gave this one four stars. I read this one for Amish in April that is being hosted by me and Elizabeth over at Lizzie Faye Loves Books. And I am so thrilled that I read this one because I really liked it. And I looked on Goodreads and there are like 11 books in this series plus a whole bunch of novellas. So I'm super stoked that I have the rest of this series to dive into. I actually noticed that book 11 doesn't come out till July. And I noticed quickly looking at some of the reviews for book number 11 that some people were saying they got it off of good off of NetGalley and I went on NetGalley and I did request book 11 um, to see if maybe the publisher will send it to me to review we shall see I don't care if I jump way ahead in the series to read it doesn't bother me in the least so the premise of this series because I did read it for Amish in April it's about a woman by the name of Kate Burkholder who is the chief of police in a small town called Painters Mill Ohio and she um, was formerly Amish. She grew up Amish and then left the church when she turned 18 and, you know, ended up joining the police academy and then ended up moving back to town and becoming the chief of police. She's estranged from her brother and sister. Her parents have passed away and she's holding a secret from her childhood from when she was about 14 years old of something that happened to her. Well, there's now a series of murders. Or there was a series of murders that took place 16 years ago involving women who were dying or being brutally murdered and having, um, Roman numerals carved into their abdomen. The killer is now returned and he seems to have escalated. So the story goes from there. I don't want to give more than that away because that's really all you need to know going into it. This book is not, if you are looking for a, you know, very sweet kind of Amish read, this is not the book you are looking for. Um, there is quite a bit of swearing in this book. There is no adult content. There is one scene with um, our two main characters having a night together but everything is behind closed doors. Um, so if you can deal with the swearing but not the adult content, you might 
this one might be okay, but this book is extremely violent, extremely violent and extremely graphic. So do keep that in mind as well if that's something that you might not be interested in, but it was still a really good story and it did kind of keep me guessing up and towards the end. So I really did enjoy it. And I absolutely recommend this series if you enjoy a good thriller. So those are all the books that I finished this week. Let me jump into the books that I'm currently reading slash hope to finish this week. So continuing on with my Amish in April reads, um, my current audiobook is The Road Unknown by Barbara Cameron. This is the first book in the Amish Road series. This is your very sweet Amish kind of romance. Um, this would be labeled as a Christian fiction, obviously. Um, and this is about a woman by the name of Elizabeth who has left her family, her Amish family in Indiana, and she's traveled to Ohio. Is it Ohio or Pennsylvania? I think it might be Pennsylvania. And she wants to kind of have her own life. She's not leaving the Amish community. She's still Amish, um, but she kind of wants to step away from her family and see what she wants to. I guess, is it a rumspringer is what they call it? And a lot of people assume that the Amish kids who do this, like kind of go wild and have parties and drink and do all these things, when that's not necessarily the case, it's kind of more about finding yourself and deciding what, you know, whether you want to go back to your family or do your own thing or what have you. So she's um, rooming with a, uh, a non-Amish girl, a, a friend that she made a number of years earlier when this, this girl was traveling in her area of Amish country. They became pen pals. Um, so she's getting a job in this small town and of course there's a guy that she's kind of falling for. So far it's really sweet. I'm only really about... 20 or 30 percent of the way through this one but it's a relatively short audiobook it's only about six and a half hours long so I should get through this one relatively quickly but yeah it's it's enjoyable and I'm liking it so far um, the next one that I'm currently reading on it as a physical book I plan on getting a lot more of this read tonight while I'm sitting here editing this video and that's Home by Dark by Marta Perry um, this is the first book in the Watchers in the Dark series um, this one is so far, excuse me, um, I got the hiccups. This is another one about a former, uh, person who was formerly Amish. She grew up Amish. And then at the age of 18, she took off with a local boy, uh, a local, um, non-Amish boy. And they got married and had a baby and then he passed away. Did he pass? I think he passed away. And she's now back in town because her mother-in-law, um, willed her house to their daughter. So, and there's also some strange things happening in town. Marta Perry does really great Amish um, mystery novels. So I will definitely update you guys more on this one once I um, get it done probably for next week. So yeah, so, so far I'm really enjoying this one. Um, my current uh, ebook that I'm reading uh, is another relatively shorter book. It's about 200 and some odd pages. This is another Nat Galley read and it's Where There's a Will by Beth Corby. This is a... Um, a novel that is set in the UK, in London, uh, or in England, I should say. And it's about a girl who, her name's Hannah, she kind of doesn't know what she's doing with her life. She's fluttering from job to job, she's in school, but she doesn't really want to be a teacher per se. And then they go see this estranged relative who ends up leaving them all some money, or something in a will. And she kind of needs to find the clues, and she's working with his assistant, um, this guy by the name of Alec. So. I'm about 30% of the way through this one. Like I said, it's a relatively shorter read, so I should get through it soon in the next couple days. Um, but I am quite enjoying it. And uh, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's right from the very beginning, this book had me laughing out loud. So this is going to be a great romantic comedy. And uh, I will update you guys next week on what I thought about it. Um, I am also, my Four Years of Harlequin book project that I'm currently reading, you guys know I always have a bunch of books on go at the same time, is Out of This World Marriage by Maggie Shane. Um, I'm enjoying this one so far. I'm about 40 pages into it, not very far, but, um, this one is kind of fun. For those of you who are fans of the X-Files, and I mentioned this last week, this is definitely your kind of a book. Um, and Maggie Shane is such a great writer. So our main character, Tom, is it Tom? Thomas or Tom. He, um, when he was a kid, he started to see aliens. Um, like, you know, he would get this signal in his head and feel this buzzing and he'd have to leave the farmhouse that they lived in. I don't know where this takes place. I want to say Kansas or Iowa or something like that. Um, and, uh, and then he would go when he heard this buzzing sound. Well, one day when he was about 10, he meets with this little girl by the name of Janelle, who is an alien, essentially. And he tries to, like, rescue her because she's all alone in the woods. And then he leads her back to this clearing, and then she disappears. 
Um, and now it's, you know, let's say it's 20 years later and he hasn't heard the buzzing since that day. And, you know, he figured it was something from his childhood. He was making it up. It was just all in his head kind of an idea. But everybody else in this town seems to believe in aliens and that they always see these aliens. And then all of a sudden now Janelle arrives back. There's this explosion in the woods behind his house and he goes back and there she is. And it's the same little girl that he remembers. It, she's not a little girl anymore. She's a grown woman. Um, but it's her all grown up from, you know, and that's about as far as I am into the story at this point. But so far I am really enjoying it. I do love Maggie Shane's writing. And, you know, for a contemporary romance novel, I, I love the whole alien kind of aspect to it. And that's really fun. Um, so, yeah, obviously, I will let you guys know more, more about that one next week. And last but not least, the Babysitter's Club, I am, Babysitter's Club book I am currently reading is Marianne and the Great Romance by Anna Martin, um, book number 30 in the BSC series. I think this is one that everybody who read this series, like, it was kind of like a milestone book in the series. Because this is the book that Marianne's dad marries Dawn's mom. And, um, yeah, it's it's going to be cute. It's going to be a lot of fun. This is one of the only ones that I think did a to be continued. Um, at the end of this book, it, to go into book 31, which is Dawn's Wicked Stepsister. So I'm hoping to get to that one in the next week or so. I'm on hold for that one at the library. Um, but, yeah, this one, again, a milestone book. And so far, I'm loving it. So, that's all for what I'm currently reading. I told you guys this might be a shorter video. Are you proud of me? I'm proud of me. Um, so, the books that I bought this week. I only got two. Two print books this week, but they are both relatively new releases. The first one, I couldn't say no. I saw it at Walmart for 40% off this week, and I had to buy it because it's gorgeous. The Cliff House by Ray Ann Thane. I am so thrilled to have a copy of this. It is going to be so, so good. I have heard such good things about this. This edition of it is just stunning with the uh, the deckled edges and the French flaps. It's just absolutely gorgeous. This is the story of um, two sisters who um, are a, a story of sisters. Hold on, bear with. Um, after the death of their mothers, uh, sisters Daisy and Beatrice uh, found a home with their aunt in the beautiful and welcoming town of Cape Sanctuary. So I guess that they, they spent time with their aunt and then they grow up and they move away and then they come home to the house again to, um, I guess, to deal with stuff going on in their adult lives. So yeah, oh, it's just stunning, isn't it? I'm so happy to have it. So the other one, for something a little bit different, not really, um, is this book. And I am so thrilled that I found this. I got this for 25% off at Shoppers Drug Mart. Um, I went in to go pick up something and I, of course, walked by the book. I can't not look at the books. And I saw this one and I, des I decided to pick it up because I had it on hold at the library on audio. But it was going to be something like a 14-week wait and I want to read this one, like, right away. Unfortunately, my May TBR is rather full. Um, so this will definitely be getting read in June, I guarantee it. But this is The, Quintland si the Quintland Sisters by Shelley Wood. For those of you who are Canadian, definitely you have probably you probably know the stories of the story of the Dion quintuplets. This is a fictionalization account of the Dion quintuplets. Um, for those of you who don't know, they were um, they are five sisters who were born in Calendar, Ontario, uh, which is about three and a half hours north of Toronto in the 1930s, 1934, um, and um, they. They are believed to be the first surviving set of identical quintuplets born. And of course, 1934, obviously, it was natural and all those things. And they were born to a rather poor family, a uh, French-Canadian, uh, their parents. And they, at the, at a very, I think, I think they were still just infants. What does it say it back here? Um, okay, so the story, this story is told, as I said, this is a fictionalization um, told by a, um, a woman. So it says here, I'm just going to read the back for you guys. Uh, Emma is just 17 when she assists at the harrowing birth of the Dion quintuplets, five tiny miracles born to French farmers in hard scrabble, Northern Ontario in 1934. Emma cares for them through their perilous first days. And while the government removes the babies from the Francophone parents, making them wards of the British King, Emma signs on as their nurse. So they were removed by the government from their parents and they were moved literally almost across the street to where the homestead, where they lived or where their parents lived. And this entire, like, 
thing was built up around these girls. There was like, um, they were almost put on display like at a zoo. And there was viewing times that you could come in and see them. And, you know, the world embraced them at the time because it was during the Depression. And, you know, they kind of wanted some sort of a miracle to, to look at. And they were essentially treated as animals or on display. And it's a story that's fascinated me ever since I first heard about it, like right from when I was much younger. And I did go through a big period of time where I was obsessed with reading about them because I just found it so fascinating on what happened to these poor girls um, and to their parents and to the rest of their family um, and how they were treated. And, you know, all that money did not even, they barely even saw any of it. And I think it was much, much later that they actually ended up fighting for it to get money because, of course, it should have gone to them. Um, yeah, so, like, there's a whole author's note in the back that I did read. And it said, in 1955, when Marie, Annette, Cecile, and Yvonne, which were four of the girls, turned 21, only $800,000 remained in their trust fund. Which, when you think about how much money they probably brought in, I think it was in the billions. Like, no joke. Um, oh, here we go. Between 1934 and 1941, tourism res revenue amassed by the Ontario government related to Quintland, which was the name of this like place, was estimated to be half a billion dollars. And they saw less than a million of that. Or less than a million was left by the time they turned 21. So, yeah, this is going to be really interesting and probably a little bit of a difficult read, I think. Um, most of the books I've read on them were, were more biographical in nature and I actually did visit their museum up in Calendar because my mom has family in North Bay. Um, my mom's aunt lives in North Bay and when I was a teenager we went up to visit her, visit them for the weekend. And since we were up there I, I knew how close we were to Calendar, about a half an hour away. And my dad took me because he knew it was like something that I was kind of really interested in. And there, I believe it was the parents' house that was turned into a museum. And yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. utterly fascinating. Um, if you are interested in all in Canadian history or just history in general, mm -hmm. I highly recommend that you might pick. I mean, this is a fictionalization, so it's not um, a nonfiction novel, but it, it might be quite interesting to you anyway. So yeah, so sorry, I didn't mean to go on about this book, but I am just super excited. I've got my hands on a copy of it, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. And part of the other reason that I wanted to get it as um, a print book is because um, it, throughout the, the book there's actually original newspaper clippings from the time um, you know and the entire book is told through diary entries of this uh, uh, made up nurse but she does diary entries and that's kind of what this whole story is about I'm assuming she's not a real person but don't quote me so yeah I mean Really, really good, and I'm looking forward to that one. So, oh, I almost forgot. Oh, my goodness. So here we have my next 40 Years of Harlequin book project. This is for next week that I will start this coming week. So let me go ahead and open this up. Um, sorry, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I was just so excited about showing you guys my new books. Ooh, ooh, Harlequin Intrigue. Ooh, yay. Outlawed by B.J. Daniels. Yay. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, this is going to be so good. A devil in blue jeans, it says. Trouble, trouble blew in like tumbleweed. The same time Delaney's new ranch hand, Cooper McLeod, showed up. His rock-hard, denim-clad body was enough to make her knees go weak. Uh, but sin himself itself danced in the cowboy's indigo eyes. Have you ever actually met anybody who has indigo eyes? It, it seems very prevalent in romance novels. I've personally never seen it. Um, he was looking to charm her all right, out of her senses and out of her ranch. Cooper was more of a blood ombre than an imposter ranch hand, and he could tell Delaney Lawson knew it, all fire and vermilion. She was quite a woman, the kind that might persuade him to change his ways, only that didn't matter. He had a job to do. He had to get her ranch before she got to him. So that sounds really good. I'm looking forward to this one. Yay, a BJ Daniels. So this one, like I said, is from 1996. So yeah, so this is going to be fantastic. I was in high school <laughs> when that one came out. Um, so I'll just quickly show you guys some of my knitting. Um, actually, I will be right back and show you guys my knitting. So I finished a project this week, you guys, a knitting project. Um, not a sweater. 
but I finished my socks. Yay! <laughs> so these are my running through socks designed by Brandy Miller. Um, they are a gorgeous pattern. You guys can probably see the patterning in here. Um, you know, these different little stitches and stuff like that. Um, using yarn overs and stuff like that. I don't want to give away the pattern. It's a paid for pattern on Ravelry, but very affordable and highly recommended. Please do go ahead and check it out if you're looking for a fun little sock pattern to do. Um, I, when I do sock patterns, I tend to just take the pattern for the sock and I do the rest of it myself. So the toe that I use is a rounded toe that comes from the Vanilla Latte Sock Pattern, which is a free pattern on Ravelry, so I use that for my toe. And then I knit for about, from the toe, I knit for seven inches, because that's, you know, I measure my own foot. And then I do the Fish Lips Kiss Heel, which is the heel that I do here. And this is an, another paid for pattern on Ravelry, but it's only a dollar. Guys, absolutely worth it. And if you buy it, don't be intimidated by it. The pattern is 16 pages long. But all you really need is about two paragraphs. It shows you how to um, measure your foot and this and that. All I do, or all I did, um, secret to this pattern, is I measured my foot um, from the tip of my toes to the back of my heel. And whatever that is, mine came out to be eight inches, you minus one inch from it. So that's why I do seven inches, and then I do the fish lips kiss heel. And then I knit as much up the leg as I want to. And then I just do my ribbing, and that's it. Like, that's my standard sock recipe um so yeah I absolutely love it um I know some people who do socks like to do wrap and turns and short rows for their heels and they fit they fit those people but I find the fish lips kiss heel fits me very very well I'm wearing a pair of hand knit socks right now and every time I do them this way they fit me perfectly so like I said I just substitute in whatever pattern I'm doing um for the foot I would only do the pattern on the top of the sock of course because you don't want the patterning on the bottom of your foot and then for the leg, I will go all the way around. But I always leave an inch after the heel, um, just for the back of your foot, because you don't want that pattern rubbing on the back of your shoe. So just a little sock lesson for those of you who might be new sock knitters. Um, but yeah, I really, really love these. So of course, because I finished a pair of socks, I had to start a new pair of socks. And if you guys watched last week, you saw the yarn that I pulled out. Guys, it is gorgeous. Oh my God, it's so gorgeous. So I have to show you the bag that it's living in because... I try to match the bag with the yarn as much as I can. Bought this bag not long ago, and it is an Australian animals bag. So we've got parrot and tortoise and koala. Look at the little koala. Crocodile and a kangaroo. Um, but yeah, and uh, what's this one? An emu. An emu. Look at how cute he is. So yeah, so I love this bag. I think it's stinking adorable. So anyway, on to the socks. So... I'm doing another a pattern that is free off of Ravelry, and the pattern is called Blueberry Waffles. It is just a knit and purl pattern. You do two rows, just knitting all the way around, and then you do two rows of knit two, purl two, and that's the whole pattern. And that's how it looks. Isn't that awesome? I love how it looks, like, bumpy, but I felt that this yarn needed just a little something. So there it is without a pattern. That's the yarn without a pattern in it. And then there it is with the pattern, but isn't it gorgeous? So I'm just working on the toe um, and the yarn, which is absolutely beautiful, is from a company that no longer makes yarn because I tried to link it last week, you guys, and I could not find her store anymore. I think she's gone out of business or I I'm really disappointed because A, I, I love that. It was Evil Goat's, Evil Little Goat. So evillittlegoat.com, it doesn't go anywhere anymore, you guys, unfortunately. And this was her Bouncy Goat Base, which is an 85 Superwash Merino, 15% nylon. And the color is Three Little Birds, which I believe is a Bob Marley song reference, but don't quote me. But it's just gorgeous. And I mean, it goes so well with the bag, doesn't it? <laughs> so yeah, so I'm really enjoying knitting on these ones. It's been a lot of fun. And it's a great kind of mindless pattern, you know, as long as you know what row you're on, you're good. Um, and yeah, so I'm really, really enjoying that. Um, and that's all I have to show you. Oh, no, hold on. I've been knitting a bit on my sweater too. Well, I was at the hospital on on Wednesday. I got some, or yesterday. I got some uh, some knitting done on this. So this is my um, Comfort Fade Cardi by Andrea Mowry. Um, and there's where I was the last time I showed you guys up there. And so that's what I've gotten done. I'm about five inches into the body, and I think I have to go to 14 inches. So I still have a bit of a ways to go on this. But it's just knitting and purling back and forth at this point. So, yeah. So, it's going to be a cardigan. Let me sit back a little bit and I'll show you guys. 
So there's the sleeves. There's the cardigan. I love it. It's going to be awesome. Eventually, whenever I get it finished. Um, <laughs> I'll get there. I'm not too worried about it. You know, we're getting into summer. If I can finish three sweaters over the summer, I will be all set for next fall. Let me tell you. So yeah, um, I don't have my cross stitch handy to show you guys. I didn't get a lot done on that, a lot more done on that one. So that's fine. And last but not least, real life stuff. Excuse me. My Starbucks iced tea. So real life stuff. First of all, my dad's fine. Everything turned out so well. Um, it was a long day on Wednesday, let me tell you. Um, I felt so bad for him. I really, really did because my dad, I mean, he had a heart attack about 15 years ago. And he only spent like two days in hospital. So he really doesn't, rem like he remembers it, but it was, it was a minor heart attack. So it wasn't, you know, he wasn't really, really sick in the hospital. Do you know what I mean? Whereas this was a little bit more serious. Um, and, um... So we had to be there at 6.30 in the morning. So we were there about 20 after 6 and we got, he got registered and he, uh, he got taken, it went in, he went in through day surgery, even though he was being admitted to stay for a few, you know, he's still there. He's going to probably be there till about Sunday, I think. And they said three or four days, you know, at least. Um, and, um, so he went in there, he had to have the IV put in and he was scheduled to go in at 8 AM for surgery. So I thought, fine, no problem. Right. So we're sitting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, like nine o'clock comes and the nurse comes out and she apologizes. And she says there was an emergency that they had to do from the night before. So that's what was taking so long. So it was finally at 930 when they took him in. And if any of you have ever been for surgery or any sort of procedure like that, you know, like he was sitting there and he had something in his hands and he just kept turning it over and tapping and bouncing his leg. And, you know, you can tell the anxiety and I would be feeling exactly the same way. And I felt so horrible. Um, finally, they took him in and um, they told me about three hours. So I figured, okay, I was going to go wander around the hospital. I was, my mom's like, you should go and like, go get a coffee at Tim Hortons, like go up the street. And I thought I wasn't leaving because I had prime parking at the hospital. <laughs> I was going to have to park a mile and a half away if I left. So, and besides, I wanted to be there just in case, you know what I mean? So, um, I just thought I'll just go down and eat at the calf. The calf was not bad. I got a bagel and whatever. Anyway, they said three hours and so I figured, okay, at 1230, I'll go back up and sit like in the waiting room area and, you know, wait for him. And I waited and waited. And so, okay, it's still recording. My mom's calling me, but I'll talk to her in just a minute. So I waited and waited and waited. And then they, um, finally he was done about 1.30 and everything was fine. Everything was great. No complications. Um, he's up, he's up and walking around. Um, he's not eating anything more than jello. He hasn't needed a lot for pain management. They're actually, they've got him on a morphine, like with the button that he could, but he's only pressed it once. Um, and he, um, they're going to, the anesthesiologist talk, came in and talked to him today and said they're going to take him off the morphine drip and give him a pill. So it's, he's doing very well. Um, they're going to start getting him on actual solid foods in the next, you know, day or so, I guess. And yeah, so that's about it. Garrett's job, we still haven't heard anything yet. It's only Thursday. They said by the end of the week. So fingers crossed for tomorrow. Um, but I'll update you guys on that next week. But anyway, that is it. I'm going to call my mom back and I will talk to you guys later. Take care, everybody. Happy reading. Thanks so much for watching, guys. <laughs> Bye.